Hi, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to SA Accounting Academy. Uh, here's a short clip on one of our previous webinars. I hope that you really do enjoy it. Good day, everyone, and welcome to this CPD learning activity that is hosted by the SA Accounting Academy and presented by myself, Anton van Wijk. Today's topic is IFRS 10, Consolidated Financial Statements per the full IFRS uh, set of accounting standards. So we're going to be investigating especially the concept of control and what that means, uh, especially taking into account the fact that control used to be defined in IAS 27 and had a different definition and now has actually been expanded on and elaborated on quite significantly. All right, so again, welcome to today's session on IFRS 10, Consolidated Financial Statements. So on the agenda today, an introduction to the standard. The scope of IFRS 10 is what we obviously need to investigate to make sure that IFRS 10 actually applies. Then the biggest part of the webinar, what is control? And remember, it's not just the definition. We start off with a definition, but it's very important to unpack the contents of the definition, the components to break them up into smaller components and to look at each component that constitutes in the bigger picture control, to look at those components separately to make sure that we understand how to determine control, how to interpret situations, and then also how to apply it correctly so that we can look at consolidated financial statements. Then some interesting accounting requirements that are stipulated by IFRS 10. And then lastly, just a quick look at what an investment entity is and also why it is relevant in IFRS 10. So let's make a start. All right, so if we look at the introduction to IFRS 10, a few matters that I would like to bring to your attention. Before IFRS 10, we had IS 27 that was named separate and consolidated financial statements. So that was the standard that dealt with financial statements of a parent entity that elected to prepare separate financial statements. And then after those separate financial statements, all the concepts that related to the parent's consolidated financial statements were then also listed in IS 27. So as we said there, it jointly dealt with preparing separate financial statements and also consolidated financial statements. Control in IS 27 was defined as the power to govern the financial and operating policy decisions of another entity. So the definition was relatively simple and there wasn't as much guidance in IS 27 relating to control as there is in IFRS 10. It wasn't very prescriptive about certain aspects, such as recognition of gains and losses on disposal of an interest, especially where control was not relinquished. Because we need to understand that if you look at my example there, an 80% interest, and then there's a disposal, and we end up with a 60% interest, and both of them are controlling interests from a consolidation point of view. It looks quite funny to say, that there is a gain on disposal that runs through profit and loss, okay? So if you retain control, and that is very important, what, you know, what should we do? Because before and after the transaction in which you disposed of that 20% interest, you retained control. And effectively, your consolidation process was exactly the same as before the disposal. You still, after the 20% disposal, you still consolidate 100% of assets, 100% of liabilities, etc., and 100% of equity. But the point is just that the allocation of the equity between the parent and the non-controlling interest, i.e. the people that do not control the subsidiary, the allocation of equity between those two sets of owners is actually just different, that's all. So we're playing around in inverted commas with equity allocation. So the question that arose is, should that be running through profit or loss, okay? Now in IS 27, that was not an issue. 
So we'll have to determine now in IFRS 10 where that is. If we move over, you know, over to IFRS 10, the objective of IFRS 10 is to establish principles for the presentation and preparation of consolidated financial statements when an entity controls one or more entities. All right, so it's obvious uh, in that sentence that we're looking at presentation, we're looking at preparation of consolidated financial statements, and we're looking at the concept of control. All right, so those are the important areas. So to meet the objective, IFRS 10 requires an entity who's the you know called the parent because a parent is an entity that controls at least one subsidiary. That's important. So an entity cannot be a parent if it doesn't have at least one subsidiary. So an entity that is a parent controls one or more entities, and such a parent must present consolidated financial statements unless it is specifically exempted from such preparation. The next objective of IFRS 10 is to define the principle of control and also to establish control as the only basis for consolidation. IFRS 10 sets out how to apply the principle of control, which you will see in this CPD learning activity that we're doing now. How to apply the principle to identify whether an investor controls an investee, the person who is invested in, and therefore must consolidate such investee. It sets out I would say limited, but at least it sets out accounting requirements for the preparation of consolidated financial statements. And lastly, it also defines an investment entity. And this is already interesting. It sets out an, except, an exception or exemption from consolidating particular subsidiaries of an investment entity. So this means that investment entities can sometimes be exempt from consolidation, but it's not exempt from consolidation in all aspects. Because remember, an investment entity that is a parent would mean that the investment entity controls at least one other entity, making the other entity a subsidiary. Now, that subsidiary must meet certain requirements before the parent, who is the investment entity, can be exempted from consolidation. And we'll look at that right at the end of the webinar. Now, also interesting, IFRS 10 does not deal with the accounting for business combination transactions or the impact thereof on consolidated financial statements and also, therefore, resultingly not with the goodwill that, arise, that, that arises from a business combination transaction. Now, something that's very important, ladies and gentlemen, is the fact that IFRS 10, we might think IFRS 3's impact is not so big. It actually is because IFRS 10 is obviously just the next step of an IFRS 3 transaction that results or that, that basically creates a subsidiary for a parent entity. IFRS 3 is applicable to the date of acquisition. Now, when you look at IFRS 3, IFRS 3 only applies when control is obtained. So what this means is that IFRS 3, the standard that deals with business combinations, governs that particular date on which control is established. And then it's just natural that from that date, we have control. And therefore, IFRS 10 would be applicable. So in the bigger scheme of things, to decide whether IFRS 3 has led to control over another entity by the acquirer in the business combination, we would also have to apply our knowledge in respect of IFRS 10. So there's a very important interaction between IFRS 10 and IFRS 3. But that is the only interaction that IFRS 10 actually has with the acquisition itself, is just to help determine whether there is control. So once we've established that there is control, then IFRS 3 deals with the rest of that acquisition transaction on the date of acquisition. And as we understand, IFRS 3 basically requires that all assets and liabilities that are acquired in a business combination 
are measured at their acquisition date, fair values, and not at cost price, which means that if we have a net asset value at the acquisition date, I hope that you enjoyed that video. For more of our webinar videos, go to www.accountingacademy.co.za. Thank you and have a lovely day.